What's up guys, my name is Yoon Gray. Hope everyone's doing well. On today's video, I'll be showing you how to do the ministry farm. Now, if you're unfamiliar with it, uh, the ministry farm is a farm that takes advantage of a very small window of opportunity during a Winds of Change quest called a Chance Encounter in order to spike and kill a large number of foes. And that window I just mentioned happens during a specific stage in that quest when the AI of the hostile foes is being commanded to walk to a specific location. And where we take advantage of that is on a specific, very narrow stairway during that stage in the quest, which we will then body block the hostile foes from moving past. And the reason this is all possible is because all hostile AI during this stage of the quest will no longer cast any direct damaging skills on our character. The main reason I, I wanted to make a guide for this farm is so that there's an easy to understand, intricately explained, step-by-step how-to, detailing the mechanics of the quest stages and AI for the entirety of the run. Because once you learn the mechanics of the quest and AI for this farm, it will help teach you how to navigate any instances where you will need to make an on-the-spot adaptive decision. Because chances are, not a single run of the farm will be like the last. Plus, I've seen a lot of not entirely correct information or terms used for this farm. Uh, for, for a normal farm like raptors or vaders, the range of decision making is extremely minimal because the only real RNG is mob spawns. For the ministry farm, AI against AI decision making within multiple different changing quest stages gets added to the mix and that makes things a little crazy. Alright, third and final portion of the intro. And that is the reason to do this farm. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of farms out there in this game. But not all farms are about defeating foes. Some of them don't even require a single foe to be dealt with. Like chest running. Where you just hunt for specific rare and expensive items. Um, but chest running has a cost barrier of entry. Another form of farming, speed clearing, has multiple types of entry barriers. Like consumable cost and human coordination. But once it's set up. The Ministry of Farm requires no barrier of entry other than adding heroes to your party, loading builds, talking to an NPC in Kainang, and going. Because the cost is so little to do the farm, it makes the worth of drops obtained from the farm seem even greater. The drops you can get from this farm ranges wider than any other farm I've ever seen. Core and factions drops can be obtained from this farm, minus like location mob type specific drops. Um, an example of that would be things like Echo Vault Shields, Golden Phoenix Blades, and plus armor or damage versus, for example, skeletons or like char, like modded type gear, can't drop here. Unidentified armor drops are non-existent in the loot table, so you'll always get equipable gear. One of the biggest reasons why drops from this farm are so valuable is that they're old school, and therefore far more collectible. Now, I do, I'll do my best to list the most notable drops from this farm. Offhands. Bladed Shield. Defender, Tall Shield, Crude Shield, Ornate Buckler, Spike Targ, Shield of the Wing, Aegis, Skull Shield, Wooden Buckler, Paper Fan, Paper Lantern, and Jux. Physical Weapons, Shinobi Blade, Katana, Jite, Broadsword, Dadao, Fell Blade, Fiery Dragon Sword, Tyrion Cleaver, Canthan Cleaver, Spiked Axe, Mammoth Axe, Supreme Bludgeoner, Glowing Runic Maul, Platinum Longbow, Wooden Flatbow, Chromium Shards, Stilettos, Psy, Platinum Sickles, and Split Chakrams. Staff. Bow Staff, Dragon Staff, Wing Staff, Smiting Staff, Channeling Staff, Conjuring Staff, Eerie Staff, Platinum Staff, and Metal Elemental Staffs. Wands. Dragon Breath Wand, Cane, Baneful Scepter, and Platinum Wands. And, of course, I can't forget to mention arguably the main drop here. And that's an item called a Ministral Commendation. It's an item that you turn into either Iza Yoi for Purity Weapons, or Ron Tai for Imperial Guard Requisition Orders. Imperial Guard Requisition Orders can then be turned into either Shin Zi for Imperial Weapons, or Zan Lei for one of three items. An Imperial Guard Reinforcement Order that summons three Imperial Guards, a Seal of the Dragon Empire, which gives you a 10% Moral Boost, or an Imperial Guard Lockbox. 
The Imperial Guard lockbox is always my choice. It's just an RNG box that can give a bunch of stuff like consumables, unique green weapons, lockpicks, mini pets, or three Tingu support flares. The Tingu support flares summon three random class Tingu allies. So there is quite a bit of setup before you're able to start the farm. Once it's all set up though, this is the quickest and easiest farm to jump into. First step, step one, uh, is to choose which class you want to do, do it on. Most, if not all, classes can complete the farm, but depending on which class you decide to use, some may have a much higher chance of failure. I always do this farm on Dervish, and I believe from what I've seen and experienced that it has the lowest average failure rate. Other top choices would be Ranger, Warrior, Assassin, Paragon, pretty much classes with 70 or 80 armor. It is possible to do the farm on caster classes, but most fall short often if you get unlucky before the spike and take too much trap damage. Second step, make your way through the normal mode versions of the Winds of Change quest line until you get to the 18th quest called A Chance Encounter. Normal mode shouldn't be much of a problem for anyone. If you're like me though, and you play all of your characters a lot, and just so happen to have completed past the A Chance Encounter quest, you have one of two options. Option one is pick another character to do the, to do the farm on. Option two, make your way through the hard mode version of the quests. Ah, uh, which is what actually I ended up doing. Third step, load the builds and optimize your own and your hero's gear. I do not recommend going into this farm without adequately ruined heroes. Since the 100 blades build is the most effective for all classes, this guide should easily translate to others. You can use any requirement sword with any mods on it, as long as it has a plus five armor mod. It doesn't have to be customized. You don't have to meet the requirement. It doesn't need a plus percent damage mod on it or a 2020 Sundering mod. As long as you have 10 in swordsmanship, the spike will always kill. You can use pretty much any decent tactic shields for this farm. It does need to be at least one rec lower than what you have spec into tactics. The reason why is because the hostile ministry mobs will weaken you before the spike at the end, lowering your attributes by one, and losing eight armor from not meeting your shield's requirement could mean the difference. I just farm so much that I just decided to min-max my shield mods. So the best in slot shield mods for this farm actually are the uh, minus three physical damage while hexed mod and plus 60 HP while hexed handle. For Dervish, I, I recommend full blessed insignias. Um, I have full windwalkers on mine, but they were on there before I started doing this farm, and I use this gear for doing other things too. Um, other classes that don't have any enchants will want to go like plus armor versus elemental damage, or just any plus armor versus all armor types ones. If you're setting this up on a dervish, it's best to have a 3 plus 1 mysticism headpiece. Um, you want earth prayers at least 5. So that even when you're weakened, you'll still get the plus two regen per condition from Conviction. Always have tactics maxed out for the health from Healing Signet. For the for the team setup, I would load just exactly what I have in the description. I've been doing this farm for about a year and a half now, and I feel like what I've adjusted this into is the best hero setup for this farm. The, the only thing that uh, everyone might not be able to do is add a second writ. Because obviously you won't have completed Winds of Change on the character you're doing this on and won't have access to Zayri. So if you don't have a Mercenary Writ, then just convert this uh, Signets of Spirit healer build onto a Necro. So I actually didn't used to use Ogden for this before. Um, I just brought my normal Necro Bip healer that I used everywhere else. And I do have to say, having a UA Res and Healing Seed makes it near impossible to fail at the start. Way better than a Bip. Um, I used to fail like 1 out of every 10 runs before changing. The only other bit of setup I have for you is a tiny little control tweak. I like to have my, sero my heroes set up in my party exactly like they are now. Mostly just heroes 1 through 3. And that's because as soon as you load into the farm, you'll flag those 3 heroes around. So you won't have to change your hero flagging keys. But I do recommend adding a hotkey to tell your monk hero to use skill 1. So I, I have hero one to use skill one as Q. And so I just target myself and press Q to get my Ogden to use healing seed on me. 
not entirely needed, but it, it does help with the farm. All right, fourth and final step. Change the hard mode. Talk to the Herald of Purity. And start the farm. All right, I'll pause it here. For this first start of the guide, I'm just going to commentary over a pre-recorded video so I can pause and better explain things. Then next, I'll show a non-paused run to hopefully help you understand how the quest works. Um, I'll give each stage in the quest a number. So right now, we'll call this stage one. During stage one, all that happens is some NPC dialogue. Your first time doing this, it will take some time, like around like two and a half minutes um, for stage one to complete. But on subsequent runs, the NPC dialogue will complete in exactly 40 seconds. Your objective in stage one is to position yourself and your heroes in order to increase your chances of surviving once the 10 ministry NPCs turn hostile. At any point during stage two, three, and four, if Miku dies, then your party will be forced back to caning. So the first thing I do when I load in is position heroes one, two, and three like this. This is why I recommend earlier to, ha to have your party ordered like mine. Um, I have my healing monk on one, Soul Twisting Root on 2, and SOS Healer Root on 3. I flag my Monk here in position 1, near where we spawn in. The Soul Twisting Root, I flag to the northwest a little bit, to here. And I flag my SOS Healer Root near these three Ministry NPCs by the stairway. Once both Rits are in their flagged positions, you want to force cast all of the Spirits, except for Rejuvenation on the SOS Root. Once we've accomplished that, we will then position the SOS writ back into the same line as the two other flagged heroes. And then force cast rejuvenation once it reaches the flag. What we're trying to do with this flagging setup is keep the heroes responsible for keeping the rest of us alive out of harm's way. So by keeping them at least as far back, they're actually out of range of four or five of the minister foes in the back. And not within the normal party ball, so they're not affected by panic or keystone signet interrupts. The reason why we use signet of spirits and blood song on this location right here is because that's where we're going to stand with the rest of the party. By doing this, we create a more tight-knit ball of allies so that hopefully the ministry foes have a higher chance of targeting someone in that main ball. We do that for two reasons. To keep damage off of the backline heroes, but the main reason is because of healing seed. So by balling everyone, in this tight ball, the more damage I take, the more health my adjacent allies will be healed for. And one other very cool mechanic of a healing seed is that it's actually the only monk skill in the game that can heal spirits. So once that's all set up, we just wait. The, the only other bit of setup I do is at uh, 39 seconds in, I tell my monk to start casting healing seed on me, and I, I keep my resolves window open. I'll, I'll go into why in just a second. Okay, now we're at stage two. At 40 seconds in, the ministry NPCs will turn hostile and begin attacking you. Pretty much the only thing you do now is see space. Once the NPCs at the front are dealt with, um, unflag your heroes. I like to move my way to the next closest foe, um, moving, my, moving my way to the back. And if you see here, this Ministry Purger I have targeted is using Putrid Explosion. That's actually why I have Putrid Explosion on Livia as well, so that she can DPS with it and take away explodable corpses so the Ministry foes will use it less. Just see space until they're all dead. Now we're in stage three, and things could get a little wonky starting now. During this stage, two large groups of ministry NPCs 
will turn hostile towards you, and only you. No matter where you're located in this quest stage, they'll have their target set as you, and path their location to kill you. The other things that happen in the stage is that Miku's AI is told to walk to a specific location due north. Uh, she can glitch out here and just never move, which is which is actually very rare. Um, and that's just a resign. What we want to do here is flag our entire party to this location or to the boat just north of us. The Ministry foes will always ignore your heroes. You're their only target. We just want our heroes out of compass range so they, did, they don't take any drops. This part can be a little tough to achieve at first, but, I'll, but it'll just turn into muscle memory in no time. What I like to do is as soon as the last Ministry foe dies there, I turn northeast and start walking with my party to the first flight of stairs. They're ahead of me. Um, this is why I have Rizal's party window open, to force cast Make Haste on myself. The reason we use Make Haste isn't to outrun the Ministry foes. It's so that we don't get outrun by Miku. The reason we don't want to get outrun by Miku is because in a couple quest stages, her location will trigger more NPCs to turn hostile that target us. And if, if we're too far behind her, then we risk dying later. So as I turn north and begin walking with my party here, I target myself and click Make Haste on Raza. If Raza doesn't have enough energy, I just continue to walk with the party until he does. Um, once you have Make Haste on you, flag your, flag your party and head for the stairs. So here's a massive tip I'll give you to make this form less annoying. Hold your alt key to show NPC names before you make it to the first flight of stairs and look in the direction of these NPCs right here. These NPCs are around where the fountain is in Canning normally, where the rune and scroll trader NPCs are. Target and click the rightmost NPC in this group, not this one up here that's alone, but in this group of four or five NPCs, target the rightmost one. It won't always be a Canthan peasant. Um, it can be a Canthan child or noble. What this allows us to do is once we reach the bottom of the first flight of stairs, is to hit space to interact with that NPC. And that'll make us auto walk through this portion of the quest. At this point, we're still in stage three of the quest. And right around where we reach the corner of this wall, we'll want to stop and wait for a second or two if Miku is behind us or near to passing us. Kind of around when Miku reaches the top of the third flight of stairs, she'll pause for a second. When she reaches this location, um, typically it will trigger a third group of ministry NPCs to turn hostile and begin targeting us. This is an important group to focus on because I see a lot of people who do this farm end up not killing this group because that group's pathing ends up glitching out because the person is too far ahead. That's why we wait at this corner for a second or two. If you don't stop near this corner and end up walking down the next flight of stairs too soon and getting, getting ahead of Miku, then the pathing of the third group won't be able to find a clear path to you and end up walking straight into the lower wall down here. Then during the next stages of the quest, their AI will pick a new path and end up walking back towards where we spawned at. So you want to wait a second around here so that group catches up enough to find a clear path to target you. You should still have that Canthan NPC target and press space to pass to it. On to stage four. <laughs> so stage four is, is a very quick one. The stage lasts from here until where Miku reaches the top of the stairs where we body block and spike the ministry group. All that happens during the stage is three more ministry NPC groups will turn hostile in this area, set their target as you, and try to kill you. So right now, all six group of ministry foes are trying to kill you. You should still have that Canthan NPC targeted and are all auto walking to it. And the reason why we chose that specific NPC is because during this stage, that NPC will begin to path in the same direction as Miku's path, which is the direction we need to go. So that just lets us auto path all the way to the stairs where we body block. All, all we need to do here is make sure that we're outside of casting range of the Ministry foes when they turn hostile. 
Now we're in the fifth and final stage. Stage five is triggered when Miku reaches the top of the body block stairs. And now the quest won't fail even if she dies. As soon as the stage is triggered, several things happen with the ministry foes. The first is that they're still technically hostile against you but they will not attack or cast any direct damaging skills against you. They will put up hexes and conditions on you and strip enchantment. Um, the other main thing that, that happens with them is that they're no longer directly targeting you. Their AI has now been updated and is being commanded to walk to a specific location to the south, near where we were originally spawned. This is basically a smoke and mirrors trick used by the devs to simulate your elusive escape from the ministry group while they chase Miku. Because normally you would take a left at the top of these stairs instead of going right down the right stairs so that you meet up with Zan Hei and Zayri. What I like to do at this point if Miku has triggered stage 5 is to wait again at some point on these stairs for the groups to catch up a bit. Mostly it's to wait for that third group we waited on earlier to path their way closer to us. Because what I've noticed from doing this farm for so long is that specific group can either glitch out and never move or turn around a path the way we came if they become unloaded on our compass or we walk too far away from them. So right, right now we still have that Canton NPC targeted so we'll just continue to auto walk to it. So this specific instance right here is why I chose this video to go over is to explain how the mechanics of this farm work. Um, what ends up happening on this run, and, and this will happen to you, is that third group we waited on before, way back here, gets stuck, and we don't end up killing it. So if I zoom in on the compass, I can show you why. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but if you can see that little ally icon there in the middle of that group, that's um that's a spirit of life. And how did that spirit of life get there, you ask? <laughs> well, because the, the AI in this quest is so wonky that even after the ministry NPCs turn hostile, when they summon spirits, those spirits become our ally and are hostile towards the ministry mobs themselves. And that causes some ministry foes to either become body blocked or glitched out on the hostile spirit. Um, the reason why this is an issue is because each group of ministry foes acts as a colony. If the colony has not made it to a coordinate checkpoint, then the entire group will wait until the others that are falling behind to catch up until proceeding to the next specified coordinate. So because this one this one ministry mob is stuck, it causes the entire group to stand still. So for time efficiency purposes, we'll, we'll end up ignoring that group. Now to the most important part, finding the best spot we can on the stairs so that we body block the most amount of foes. So you may end up finding a spot that works better for you, but this is this is the best spot to stand that I found. It's far enough from the bottom and the top of the stairway that it catches most foes as they're pathing through the center. My spot is on the first stairs up from the red corner top that protrudes through the stairs. I target myself in order to see my name and tap up or down to line the top of my name up with that stair. So the top of that stair is right there, and then my name is roughly in line with that stairway, while also moving one tiny little tap left of center. You don't have to get it exact, but something close to this is what I found to be most effective. Now all we have to do is maintain conviction. If you're using alcohol like I am using here, then use Feel No Pain. Use Healing Signet while waiting if you start getting blown up by traps. Before you're ready to spite, use For Great Justice. Then to the limit, when you're ready to spike, cast every metal center of the honor, 100 blades, and once they're all balled up, target the nearest mob, then whirlwind, and lastly pick up your drops. Next, I'll show an ideal, perfect situation run. So, flag heroes, precast spirits, then get in position. At 39 seconds, target yourself and tell your monk to use healing seed on you. 
and then just see space. Once all the mystery mobs are dead, target yourself again, use make haste on yourself, and flog your heroes back. Targeting that Canthan NPC, and hit space. Wait here for a second. And then hit space. And then wait here for a second, and then hit space. And then wait, space, wait, space, and kind of just trying to keep the mobs within your compass. Find the spot, main maintain conviction, and feel no pain. And then precast your stealth, then spike when they're bald. And it's that easy. So yeah, that's going to do it for the video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Really, this is my uh, first actual YouTube video since I've had my fiber installed. Uh, the reason why my uh, uploads were so sporadic for so long was because my internet couldn't really upload videos. <laughs> so if you have any questions about the form, feel free to leave a comment on the video. Uh, message me in-game. Or come hang out in my Twitch streams. And I'll be happy to help. So, see you guys in the next one. Later.